Fatty, this is going to be an unusual episode for the Leadville podcast because the race, of course, is now behind us. There's not a lot of breaking down, building up, getting you ready, or freaking you out to do for the rest of the season. That's true, Hottie. It's more time to relax and recover and tell stories about the races. And for all of these, I'm excited to have a special guest for this episode, my wife, Lisa, a.k.a. The Hammer, a.k.a. now The Lead Woman. I have to tell you, Hottie, while you and I have been using Floyd's of Leadville products this season, Lisa has been using them religiously, both in her training and during and after every race in the Lead Woman series. Lisa, tell us what Floyd's products you had your crew keep at the ready during the Leadville 100 run? Well, I think uh, most importantly, it was the balms because as soon as I sat down, I had someone rubbing stuff into my calves, into my quads, into my hamstrings. I even had them rubbing it into my neck and back. They were absolutely amazing, especially the the one with the little bit of lidocaine in it. They kind of just makes it burn a little bit when it comes in contact with your skin. Yeah, yeah. C- CBD and lidocaine yeah. together, a little bit of uh, Leadville magic in a balm. <laughs> so you were using that during the race itself, the balms? Yes, during the race itself at the aid stations when I would sit down. It was great. It felt really mm. good. How about that fatty recovery product during the race? That works out great, I think, for Floyd's of Leadville. Yeah, the the warming bombs, the cooling bombs. I honestly don't know which I was putting in. <laughs> we were just we were we were using everything and anything, but uh, it seemed to really make a difference. And uh, Lisa was just killing it coming out of the aid station. So you know the results speak for themselves. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll have. We'll have more to say about all of that during Lisa's race report coming up. Meanwhile, be sure to check out Floyd's of Leadville, our presenting sponsor at floydsofleadville.com, and use the code FATTY at checkout for a 15% discount on your first two orders. And thanks, Floyd's of Leadville, for sponsoring the show. Leadville, the podcast for the 100-mile mountain bike race presented by Floyd's of Leadville. This is Season 2, Episode 24 of the show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready, and freaks you out for the highest and hardest one-day mountain bike race in the country. Howdy, we, of course, spend a ton of time talking about the Leadville 100 mountain bike race, but have you ever been to or seen the running version of the Leadville 100? Have not been to. Of course, I always keep a close eye on it because it's exactly one, the the following Saturday after the LT100 mountain bike race. And, you know, it's a, it's a fascination point. I mean, it's mm-hmm. the first. It was the first thing Ken created when he went to t- about trying to save Leadville. And arguably, it is the most demanding. It is the most demanding of, of all the races they put on there. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. You know, until last year, um, I had never uh, been to, but had, you know, read about, had seen videos of uh, the race. But then, of course, last year, uh, Lisa's and my daughter gave the lead woman a shot and we got a chance to see it up close and personal and frankly, get a little bit scared of uh, this Leadville 100, uh, not mountain bike, running race. Um, So we... Even now, I I have a hard time wrapping my brain around the idea of doing the same distance on foot as a very hard day on a mountain bike. But this year, Lisa did the Lead Woman series, and I wanted to get her into uh, my glorious Alpine uh, basement studio (laughs) to get her to tell her story, sort of give us the perspective of someone who has done both the bike and the run. Now, Lisa, uh, most of our subscribers, listeners are well aware of Fatty's uh, Leadville 100 mountain bike stats, how many times he's done it, how many times he's finished it. But, uh, you know, I guess I'm not up to date. How many times have you finished the bike race? Believe it or not, I think this was my 15th year. 15th time. Oh, nice. So are you, is, is 20 out there? Is that the thing that's kind of motivating you? Well, now I'm getting so close and, uh, Elden seems to have a, a little addiction to this race. So my <laughs> guess is I will probably make it to the 20 year mark, 20 buckle mark. 
Yeah, I would I would say that that is very likely. And by the time she gets to the 20 mark, I should be pretty close. I think, let's see, five more, 23 plus five. I'll be at the 28 mark. And so, of course, we're going to need to go to 30. But then I think we can course. stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Who knows when this ends, Adi, I guess is really the question, right? <laughs> but, of course, you know, this was before... Lisa's, uh, you know, this was her first 100-mile bike uh, run. I I keep saying bike race, but it was your first 100-mile run of any kind, right? Before the Leadville 100 run, what was the longest run you've ever done? So back in April, um, during this kind of little training block that I was going on, I did do a 100K, which I think is about 62 miles. And that is not, that is not even remotely trivial. No. (laughs) No. So were there were there marathons, Lisa, in your past? I mean, what what kind of runner were you going into this block of training for for the lead woman? So I the, I think I've done about probably fifteen road marathons. Um, I've done a couple. I did a a fifty k several years ago, as well as a fifty miler. That kind of uh, got me a little excited about running um, trail and doing maybe an ultra. Um, but after doing the fifty. Um, Five years ago or something, I just thought a hundred just is completely out of reach, and I kind of just put it on the back burner until Melissa, kind of my daughter, um, did the Lead mm. Woman series, and then that kind of sparked my interest again. Hmm. That's very nice. Okay, that's cool. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, most for all of us, I think ninety nine point nine percent of us, the LT one hundred run is something just we can't even wrap our heads around, let alone begin to think about getting that thing done. So hats off to you. It was excellent. Um, But let's, before we get into the run, let's start from the week before when I last saw you, if we can. Let's go actually from the mountain bike race and go from there. That way we can, at least I can be part of this story. So (laughs) let's, the mountain bike race, just give us a quick synopsis of how it went and then take us forward from there. Okay. Um, Yeah, the mountain bike race, it was actually kind of a, a fun a fun ride for me. Um, it it was fun to to hang out with all of you guys and feel your um, anxieties and and um, <laughs> <laughs> and b- to be around this, but not to have this be my a my a event. Um, I was kind of laid back going into it. Um, I'd say laid back, but I had every intention of of going as fast as I could um, when the gun went off. Um, I. I didn't really hold back. Um, I gave it all I had. Um, I felt good. Uh, it, what I've noticed, though, in my training this year, um, because I've backed off on the amount of training I've done on the bike, um, I'm not. I don't have that pop. I don't have that those watts that really get me up a hill fast. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, I can endure. Um, that uh, the endurance thing is still there, um, but I just wasn't as quick as I've been in the past. So that was a little bit frustrating because I'm really uh, I, I consider myself to be a pretty good climber. And as I was going up the different uh, the climbs up Columbine, um, you know, I was getting passed, and that was a little bit odd for me. So <laughs> <laughs> took some humble pie there. Um, but yeah, the first half went really good. Uh, the second half, it, I felt it. I I was giving it all I got, and I kind of fell apart on power line coming back home. Um, but all in all, it was a good race. I caught up. Uh, I got into some good uh, trains of riders through the flat parts, which I was really, I was really worried for because um, I didn't know how I would do uh, riding flat all out there by myself in the wind. And I was actually really lucky and got. Um, hooked up with a couple of trains that helped me pull me along, and um, all in all, it was a good it was a good race. Finished, finished. I felt like you know pretty strong, and um, and still had something in the tank. I was hoping for the uh, the ten k the next day. Fatty, we should remind folks too that that Lisa did something that most led women and led men, for that matter, don't mm-hmm. do, and that is she doubled up on the fifty miler. You you're as a led woman. You were asked to choose between the 50 mile run or the 50 mile bike race. You can do both, and that's what Lisa did uh, yeah. to try. And why, why did you do that, Lisa? Why did you choose to do both? You know what? Um, I had a friend ask me that, and um, honestly, uh, bragging rights. <laughs> 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 um, yes, but I also, I mean, I really wanted to do the run because I've only done one other 50 mile run. So that, you know, I wanted to do that, and I knew I could do the bike race. So, um, you know, it, it probably hurt me in the standings overall if I really cared much about the lead woman standings um, because, 
uh, it kind of weights the the bike ride a little bit better um, mm-hmm. than the run. And so I probably hurt myself, especially having 50 mile run in my legs to start a 50 mile mountain bike race. Um, but honestly, I just wanted to finish the whole Lead Women series. I didn't care about my standings. And as for everyone, as for the other 12 women that were doing it with me, I mean, I just wanted us all to finish it. I mean, it is such a huge undertaking. And here I'm starting to cry already. <laughs> um, I didn't I didn't think I would do that for a little bit. So yeah, I just wanted everyone to succeed. So, you know, the fact that, it, that I ended up being, you know, kind of fast was, it was just a nice perk. But mm-hmm. Now, the other mandatory part of the Lead Women, Lead Man series, of course, is the 10K, which comes the day after the LT100 mountain bike race. Um, This was the only Leadville race I did this year, which was the 10K, uh, mostly because I wanted to be there with Lisa, who is a lead woman, um, and because I wanted to test myself as a runner, too, just to see what I could do. So take us through... um, Quickly, uh, you, you get up uh, Sunday morning after the, the bike race. How are you feeling? And and a little on the 10K there. Yeah. When I woke up in the morning, I was actually feeling okay. It was just the weather. Oh, my gosh. It had really taken a turn. Um, it was just mm-hmm. raining, just drenching, pouring rain out, um, which kind of made me a little nervous. I mean, we kept watching the weather reports all morning, and it said that it might break um, around uh, 1230, 1 o'clock, somewhere in there. And the race, I think, started at noon. So, um, but I was okay because I had a great, uh, I have a great rain jacket. So I was prepared. Um, but yeah, in the morning, I felt good. I was a little bit anxious because I'd not run in almost a week. I just really had been focusing on, you know, doing some uh, tr- um, just pre-race rides and having fun on the bike prior to the mountain bike race. So I hadn't run and I wondered how the legs would respond. Um, and I mean, I knew I would, I wasn't going to take this really easy. I was going to try to push myself a little bit. And it was, um, it was good to have you out there with me, pushing me. <laughs> so. Yeah. So now we cross uh, the finish line at the 10K and you, I assume, Lisa, go into immediate recovery mode or how, how does this week play out now or less than a week play out leading up into the run? Well, after I finished that run, I don't know what happened, but I went home and I got the worst crushing headache of my life. <laughs> I was mortally exhausted. I mean, I laid down and I just, I was overwhelmed. I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to get it through this week. And um, my son, who had arrived on the Friday before the race, had brought him brought with him the worst cold ever. So, of course, now and he's I'm, staying with us. Yes, and he's right. staying in the same house with us. And so, of course, I'm thinking. Oh my, I think I've got a sore throat. Oh no, I think I have a little tickle in my nose. I just, I was so scared. I mean, so, um, and that actually kind of, you know, ebbed and flowed the entire week where I just didn't know how I, I, how I was feeling. I mean, was I okay? Was I not okay? And I think that's just the total paranoia um, of an anxiety leading up to such a huge event. I mean, I've done that before with my first marathon, I remember. Um, so worried that I was going to get sick the week before. So I think I was like living out all of my fears. Uh, and it started, like I said, the minute I finished the 10K. Um, but the whole, the rest of the week, I mean, I woke up Monday morning, um, had a plan to uh, to go out and kind of do some recon um, out by the Winfield Aid Station. That is actually the 50 mile mark. Um, mm-hmm. My daughter took me out there and we just did a, a walk three miles out from the aid station and then and then returned three miles, um, which was really good. It, it kind of gave me a preview of what I was in was I was going to be in for because it doesn't you don't just send into this aid station and then turn around and, and climb back out. It's actually a three miles worth of rolling hills where you actually pass the aid station and can see everybody and go a mile past it and then backtrack. So it was kind of a good a good experience there um, to. See to see that. So we just did that as a walk. Um, and by the way, uh, Jeff and Melissa, that's my, uh, my daughter and her boyfriend, um, they did the mountain bike race and then ended up getting the worst cold of their lives as well. And they were staying in the house with us. So now I have three people that have coughing, runny nose, sneezing all in the same house with me. (laughs) It's like we were living in the plague house, Holly, I swear. (laughs) So you can see why I was a little bit paranoid. Um, And Mm. then the next day, uh, we had my daughter take me out. And actually, we just rode um, our bikes on a segment 
of the of the race um, of the run um, trail as well, and got a little bit of a feel for that, which was really good because in my mind and on paper, um, this little segment didn't look like it was going to be very a, a very big climb. Um, but seeing it on a bike, I found out that it's about a thousand foot climb over ten miles, and that's that's something. Yeah. Um, and so, and then it had a quick descent, like a two mile, really steep descent into Twin Lakes, and so. It was good. I mean, I really like to be prepared, and so that really helped with my, um, um, with my mojo for for knowing the 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 run trail as uh, path as well. So, and then the rest of the week we rested after that, and um, me and Eldon we did a lot of talking about about what he w- we expected of him, and we laid out our, our my food. We figured out times that I would be coming into aid stations. Um, Oh, you should see the spreadsheet, Hottie. Yeah. It is. It, <laughs> you think that uh, I am an over preparer? Imagine that times five, maybe ten. Um, mm-hmm. We we had so much, you know, all laid out exactly. You know how long uh, between each aid station who was going to be there, what they would be bringing. We had a list for clothes. We had a list for food. We had a list, a list for meds, for everything. You know, it, it was new to us. And my my reaction to something new is to really just, you know, prepare the hell out of it. it I, I would much rather be, you know, have 95% too much preparation than 5% too little. And that was definitely the way we went. But that really, really helped with my nerves as well it, to sit down and figure out, okay, I'm going to be hopefully here at this aid station and this is exactly what I want um, in regards to food. Um, and we actually put my food into bags. I mean, we had – and we didn't do it as a last-minute thing. We we did this kind of spread out where, um, you know, Over even days. starting yeah. on Wednesday, <laughs> we, st- we started talking about this. So I never felt really overwhelmed with it. Um, we broke it down and it was really helpful, so – yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get to the day of the race. And uh, I'm sure Hadi and I are going to have a lot of questions, but I kind of want to have you just sort of tell your story uh, from from beginning to end. I've, I've heard this a few times myself and I never get tired of it. And I will interrupt you a couple of, you know, from time to time with the perspective of the crew, which I got to do. And I'm sure Hadi's going to have a few questions as well. Hey, awesome. It's quite overwhelming to even I, how how do I put this story in, in into words into something that I can summarize <laughs> in you know 30 minutes or something because it was such a a big um undertaking uh okay so uh nerves anxiety level through the roof um like I said not only was I scared about getting sick leading up to it but so so nervous um uh, my, my, my nerves, everything were shot just even leading up to it. Um, if you said cry to me, I would cry. I mean, I was just a bottle of, of nerves. So night before the race, uh, my pacers all arrived. Um, it was good to have them, them come. We went through our checklist and everything and, um, of what was expected of my pacers and what they were to do at the aid stations. And then Eldon and I actually turned in probably around eight o'clock and, and, went to sleep and I got at least four, four or five hours of good sleep, got up about 2.30, tried to do my normal routine prior to the race. I mean, we ate breakfast, had coffee, um, you know, emptied out my, evacuated my bowels. I thought, <laughs> and I thought I had done it quite well. Um, everything was going according to plan and Eldon dropped me off at the, um, at the starting line at about, gosh, 10 to four, which was perfect timing. I just, I, I walked in, um, got lined up, uh, chatted with a few people around me, and um, before I knew it, we were off. So I'm I'm going to stop you for just a second. So of course the race starts at four in the morning and not six thirty in the morning, like in the bike race. And uh, for bike racers, of course, we all picture uh, this really packed, lots of corrals backing out, you know, across Harrison and further. What is the scene in the at the starting line for the for the run? Yeah, it's just totally different. I mean, you, there's no no um, 
it's really just self-selection on how fast you want to go, where you want to go. No one's, you know, no one cares if you are starting at the front of the group or the back of the group. I mean, you really just self-select and um, it makes it nice. I mean, that's how every every race I've ever run is. Um, you just self-select. If you think you're going to be fast, then you go to the front of the line. Um, no corrals, Hottie. Yeah. Eight, and hmm. about how many people? And start? there was, and there was, I think, about 800 people. So that's half half the amount of um that, that start the, the mountain bike race. And of course we have no bikes. So, you know, we all were just huddled in right right by the, the start line. Up until uh, Melissa tried this last year, I kind of, I, I sort of had it in my head that it was more or less the same course as the bike race. But that's not right, right? That's correct. And what is, I mean, there's about how much climbing and what is, what are the like major features that you have to know about it okay. when yeah. you do, you know, in the elevation? Yeah, that's, that's a good question to, to kind of hit before we even start the, 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 um, telling of the story. Mm. Um, it, it is, it is about a hundred miles, just over a hundred miles. I think there is between 12 and 14,000 feet of climbing in it. So quite similar to the, um, mountain bike race, but it is not the same course. I think we, um, I think maybe there's a 15 mile, um, 15, 20 miles of the same um, that we do repeat. Um, actually, it's since you guys all know the mountain bike course, it's we climb up, um, we get onto Hagerman and climb up Sugarloaf and descend Power Line. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, we hit, we kind of head over a different way to the pipeline aid station. So that's that is the same. And then, of course, at, at one in the morning, I hit that going in the opposite direction. And that's at about at about the same mileage. I think I hit the power line climb at mile 80 and topped out at mile 84 with, with the power line climb and then had to descend down um, the Sugarloaf um, descent there. So similar. That's that's really the only overlap of the two races. Um, so, but to back up, um, basically we leave town, we run around Turquoise Lake, um, and then we get to May Queen, um, which is where uh, we do, the, the mountain bike does pass. And at May Queen, we take a single track that takes us up to Hagerman, and then we get onto the Hagerman, like I said, do the uh, Sugarloaf power line descent, cut across, and then we go to, um, it's a pretty flat segment in there where we're um, slowly climbing up to the Mount Elbert trailhead. And then at that point, there's a quick two miles, very steep descent into Twin Lakes. Um, and it's not the same Twin Lakes area that we think of at the mountain bike race. It's farther down the road, and it's actually through the little town of Twin Lakes. Um, and that's at mile 40. And then at that point, um, we have a basically a seven mile climb to the top of Hope Pass, which is about a 3,500 foot climb. We peak uh, climb up that pass is actually at 12,600 feet, so very similar to Columbine. We descend down the other side to the 50 mile mark, and then we turn around and come back and do exactly the same. So I have to climb back up and over that uh, same Hope Pass again, and then right back to town. So and I, um, I, I kind of want to put, I want to underscore that because that is something I didn't really even understand it, 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 for us uh, bike riders. There's the climb up to Columbine and then we just come back down. Imagine if after you got to the top of Columbine, you had to go down the other side, you know, not all the way, not quite all the way mm -hmm. to the bottom, but then turn around and come back up at there. That makes for a, you know, a double, uh, sort of crux of the race climb that you have to do, and that really did seem like it is the the crux of the it run. is, and 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 the fact that you know within that uh, what twenty mile uh, segment, um, you know I've climbed more than seven thousand feet and descended that. So I mean it's 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 a big that that that's kind of what makes or breaks this race. Um, a lot of people fall apart on that climb, and that's the end of their day. Hmm. So that is an it overview. Is Yes. Yeah. Is it a pretty course? I mean, I guess it's Leadville, you know so I, I guess think, the answer is yes. <laughs> you know, exactly. I I think I I really, it was unbelievably beautiful. I mean, at one point I came out um, c climbing up to that 
up that pass, came out of the trees into this big, gorgeous bowl. I mean, and honestly, it brought tears to my eyes. It was so pretty. Um, you know, and then you're running through single track, through aspens. Um, uh, honestly, I thought it was it was glorious. It really was. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it, it was beautiful. And I think that's probably what brings people back, too. So... Now we're back to the start line, I guess. Okay. (laughs) Eventually, I will get to the telling of this story. Um, And of course, being four in the morning, we all start out with headlights, um, headlamps. And so uh, we descend down the boulevard. And as I was descending down the boulevard, something really weird happened to me. I had to poop. I never, ever in my entire running career have had to poop on a run. And so I was just like, what is happening to me? So literally for the next 13 miles, I was, do I need to go? Do I not need to go? Do I? I mean, and all of a sudden you start fixating on this. So that was a little bit weird for me. I, I, in retrospect, I'm looking back and I think maybe I ate breakfast too soon before I started the race. I don't know. But that was something I wasn't expecting. And it, it was a little bit, it, it made me nervous. But, um, you know, I, I made it around Twin Lakes. Oh, and prior to that, Eldon had had gone out ahead and, and was able to intersect me. Um, he had a flashing uh, a light up vest on so that I could actually pick him out of the dark. And um, it was great. Ran up and gave him a kiss and continued on my way. Um <clears throat> And then ran around Twin uh, Turquoise Lake and came out at May Queen, um, where Eldon met me again. And um, everyone else was asleep at this point. Eldon was my <laughs> my sole crew. Um, but at that point, um, we uh, I had so, been using water bottles, just carrying them and my food. And I switched out and got a vest on, and then headed up the single track, which would dump me out at Hagerman. And Eldon met me again at Hagerman. He had so, ridden his bike, so. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to barge in for just a second from the crew perspective, and I had this great idea, and I really do think it was a great idea, that I was going to try to do some of the crewing from my bike, and that, and I'm going to, I'm going to plug uh, our good friends at Banjo Brothers uh, on that, the red commuter backpack that I've talked about several times during this show. Uh, was my best friend for uh, when crewing for Lisa. If being on the bike, I was able to dash from point to point and into some places where it, crewing wasn't allowed, but that doesn't mean I couldn't be there yelling for and ringing a cowbell, which is exactly what I was doing. And with that red backpack and the, the Banjo Brothers red backpack on, I was easy to see and I was able to carry clothes and food and anything Lisa could have possibly needed. So, uh, you know, shout out for uh, for our sponsor, Banjo Brothers, on uh, on that, as well as for my uh, Shimano. And I am sort of hitting all of the sponsors real quick here. But uh, I had a Shimano uh, j- uh, wind protecting jersey on that uh, was great, whether it was three in the morning, which sometimes it was, or at, you know, as it was getting dark, um, you know, it just, it, I was able to carry a ton with that and able to just really, uh, do everything I needed to regardless of the temperature of the day. So, uh, good gear from good sponsors for sure. Uh, remember folks, the Shimano, when you go to their website, dig deep on that website, because there's more than just like cassettes and chains and crank sets. With Shimano, they have all kinds of stuff. They have clothing, they have stems and bars. So you want to check out their pro lineup. You want to check out their clothing. They have lots of great stuff. Yep. Uh, if you go to bike.shimano.com, you can check out all the stuff they have there. And yep. by the way, you still can get 15% off Banjo Brothers if you're interested in that stuff. Fatty, while I was up up at Rebecca's Private Idaho, uh, Roger, a good friend of the show, came up and pointed out his Banjo Brothers bag. He <laughs> wanted to thank you personally for passing out those subliminal messages and getting them on Banjo Brothers. Again, folks, get 15% off your order. Go to banjobrothers.com forward slash fatty dash favorites. Now, Fatty, yep. of all the spots you met, or Lisa, you can answer this, you met Lisa, which was the official feed zone? Was it, is it May Queen? Is that an official feed zone? Yes, May Queen was the official one. Yeah, May Queen is the first one. And I had hoped to see her as she crossed the Turquoise Lake Dam before then, but... Uh, there were so many crews uh, trying to get uh, there as as quickly as possible, trying to get to the May Queen aid, aid station, that they routed traffic the long way around the lake. 
and just being in my car, in spite of the fact that I was, you know, going as fast as if I were racing, trying to uh, get the uh, get to the dam on my bike, I had to make an executive decision. So I just uh, met her at May Queen instead, and just crewing out of my backpack, got her everything she needed, um, and. Uh, by then she had more or less resolved her GI issues, but I think it might be worth talking for a second about the why on those GI issues, because that's something that affects cyclists as well. That's what I was just going to say, that that not only do you need strong legs going into a 100-mile run, but it, you really do need to have a, um, a nutrition plan dialed in. And I think I thought I had it dialed in because I am I – am, super efficient at using goo products and absorbing them and not having any problems at all with my GI tract. But the longest I'd ever run is 13-ish miles. So I knew that I could I could handle goo for 13 hours. Um, and so as I talked to people, people were saying, oh, well, maybe you should try to eat real food or, or do something a little bit different the first half of the run and then go to goo the second half. And I thought, well, that's that's smart. But now in retrospect, I shouldn't have done that. I was running the hardest that I was going to run the entire day, the first part of the day. I mean, I had the most energy. Um, the, the, actually, the, the trail is runnable. So here I am running, and I'm eating things that I'm not used to. I was using cliff shot, uh, uh, cliff blocks, which I, I'm not used to. Um, I think that actually kind of added to my GI problems. And then when I came out of May Queen, I was eating a peanut butter and jelly uncrustable sandwich. Mm -hmm. I've never done that on a run. Um, and so, no, my, my my GI issues had not resolved when I passed Eldon on Hagerman. Oh. I mean, they I, I was still dealing with them. I remember running up Sugarloaf and looking out at the trees thinking, which one of those trees am I going to visit <laughs> soon? I mean, I, I just was purely miserable. And as I crested Sugarloaf and I was running along the – um, the the flat part on top before I started the descent down power line, I thought, what am I doing? I know goo products work for me. And so I flipped a goo and from 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 mile 18 to about mile 50, I never even thought about my GI. My stomach went right back to where it needed to. I didn't need to go to the bathroom. I didn't think about nausea. I had I was using the plan that worked for me, and I was dumb to try to do something different from the get-go. So so that was a great answer. So um, ran down Powerline, which is a different experience than riding your bike down it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what time What time of day is it now? Is sun's up now? Yes. So does it I, look like it does on the mountain bike race? Are we about it, the you same You know what? It's a, it is because it, it may queen... Uh, I think I hit that aid station at about 6.20. So the sun was just barely coming up. So I was a little a little early coming, going up Sugarloaf, but um, but still equally nice. I mean, the sun is coming up. The sun had started, yeah, started to come up. I would no longer had a headlamp on. Um, uh, and and then, then the descent down Powerline, the weather, you know, the weather, we'll go back to that. Um, zero forecast for rain. I, I can't believe it. No, Leadville never has a 0% chance for rain. So beautiful weather. Um, it was probably, you know, no more than 50 degrees as I was descending down power line. Um, you know, when I'm not the greatest descender, I kind of let my body go as loose as it could because I've heard people say, you, you, you know, you, if you go too fast on those descents, you'll blow your quads out. And that wasn't my idea at mile 20 in the race. So um, came down power line, you know, got on the paved road, just like the mountain bike ride, go around the fish hatchery. And at the fish hatchery, um, one of my friends had run out from the aid station to meet me, which was fantastic. And she ran me into the aid station where everybody was, which was a, oh, yeah. a nice big party. I think all my pacers, were, all my pacers were there. My family was there. Um, it, it was really nice at that point, traded out my vest back to water bottles. Cause I knew the next section, um, to twin lakes, which is about, um, I don't know, I think 14 ish, 16 miles to twin lakes, um, was just that thousand foot climb, um, over 10 miles. So headed out on that and felt pretty good. I mean, I was looking at, I'm looking at my times and, you know, I averaged, you know, 11 minute, 11 minute pace. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm running. And I think, and yeah. in, in looking back on it, this run, people say, oh, you know, as long as you're moving forward, you're going to be able to make the 30 hour cutoff. I beg to different, I differ. I think that 
there is a time that you've got to run. You've got to put in some some. You've got to put in some fast miles, or you won't make the the um the thirty hour cutoff. So uh-huh. I was feeling good running, um, heading up. I mean, it 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 kind of goes to a double track. We peel off the power the pipeline um, road onto a double track. And at that point, it's just a gradual climb. Um, you know, and I'm running along happy, happy. And of course, hmm. catch my foot on a rock. And I went sprawling. And um, <laughs> we'll post a picture or something on uh, <laughs> of how I turned out because I didn't know what I looked like. But the photographer that took the next picture of me as I came around the corner must have been laughing because I went I, I basically went sliding like a uh, into third base or something or, or <laughs> into home plate and um and I had quite quite the interesting shirt uh, sweat marks on my shirt after that. <laughs> what she is avoiding saying, Hottie, is that she had two dirt shaped boob marks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm they, sure they were on all of her uh, all of her run photos for the next several miles. Eventually, I'm, those would fall I'm off. I'm looking but. for yeah, I'm looking forward to that photo. Then uh, it's going to be oh, interesting. I think I probably made everyone at the aid station kind of chuckle um, as I as I came into the it came into the aid station with that. Oh, we all talked about you afterward. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is it? that? Is a very peculiar <laughs> dirt mark. So what? Got. What we're coming into what aid station now, so, and how many is this? So now we're gonna we're gonna be descending into to Twin Lakes aid station which is at about mile 38 and and honestly you know when I when I when I think about this race it's it I wasn't doing a hundred mile race I was doing I was running from aid station to aid station is how I sure. as I broke it up and I, I and that's what you kind of do on the mountain bike ride as well and that's that's what I did here so Twin Lakes mile 38 um I at this point hit this around noon which was really I couldn't. I couldn't have expected to hit this any sooner. I was. Ex- I was extremely excited about about rolling into Twin Lakes at about uh, uh, noon. And yeah. Yes. Is this a, is this aid station three now? I'm trying to keep track of it. Yeah. This stations. is aid station three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is mile forty, and not too far from the Twin Lakes Dam aid station. And uh, in in some ways, you've sort of paralleled the the bike uh the bike ride the difference is and this anyway someday i would love to show this to you Adi. there is the runners go on this really cool single track section that takes them into the the town i guess town a little resort area of twin lakes that we on bikes never ever see and it is really worth riding sometimes. <laughs> so, I mean, there there's a lot of trail out in Leadville that uh, that uh, cyclists uh, would enjoy apart mm-hmm. from apart from the race course, of course. And Lisa, you said you know there are times during the run where you have to run, where you have yes. to put in effort. Is this one of those times? Is that pipeline to Twin Lakes area? Is that one of those times where that, you laid it down a little bit? I real I really did. I mean, and I was passing people. People there was a lot of people walking, um, but. You know, uh, most of us were trying in in the group that I was in was basically run walking and with more emphasis on running. So, you know, and uh, you know, and now I'm 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 closing in on mile you know thirty eight ish. You know, the body's hurting. The, the body is starting to hurt, and and that worried me a little bit. I mean, it would be like, oh my, my my hip flexors hurting, and then I would you know, and then the, the trail would go down a little bit, and something else would be hurting, and and that's always a that's. That's a little nerve wracking, you know, when you're only at mile 38 and still have, you know, 60 ish miles to go if you're hurting already. So that, that, that was something that, that, that was when the pain started. Um, but as I rolled into Twin Lakes, I kind of forgot all about that. Twin Lakes is quite the party atmosphere. I think the majority of, of racers' crews set up at Twin Lakes because mm-hmm. you are going to hit this twice. Um, and it is quite the party atmosphere. So, and there's a fair amount of time between the times when they go out, and and there's and, and the crux of the race happens in between the that first and second entrance into into Twin Lakes. So, getting uh, you know as crew getting into Twin Lakes is a, a, a quite a deal. The the you are you have to park and then walk probably two to three miles to get there just because cars are lined up that far down the road. There are way more people crewing 
per uh, per racer in the run than there is in in the bike race. So it is logistically, uh, I was glad that we had done this last year because I had a much better understanding. And once again, bikes uh, turned out to be a really nice thing to have there. So we had a nice uh, easy up all set up and Lisa came in and she, uh, from our perspective, she looked uh uh, you know, two big dirt spots, notwithstanding, she looked fantastic <laughs> and uh, came in. Uh, we just switched out her food and she took off. And, uh, w- you know, we knew that you know I was going to head out to the 50 mile turnaround. But uh, for a lot of them, that meant it was going to be hours and hours before they would see her. 20 miles later in the exact same spot. Exactly. And it, like I said, noon rolling into Twin Lakes, and I was hoping beyond hope that I would be back to Twin Lakes by 8 p.m., but before dusk. That was my Eight hours, goal. 20 miles so, is, yeah. what, is what she was hoping to do. Oh. I mean, this, this, you know, this really is a huge and difficult thing that they're doing. 7,000 miles or 7,000 feet, 20 miles, two, or no, how many, how many big climbs is that? One, two, three, four. It, is it four climbs? Three. What? To get to up and over Hope Pass? Yeah. So just two. We go up it, then down it, then turn then around back. and go up it, and then okay. down it. <laughs> right. It just seems like a lot more. <laughs> no, but, but you know, and like I was telling you how I, pre, I pre-walked I pre the the descent into to Winfield, because that plays a role, because you do climb up this mountain, but then have three miles yet to go after you've gotten off the mountain to get yourself into the Winfield uh, turnaround aid station. So, um, yeah, so as I left uh, Twin Lakes the first time, I grabbed my trekking poles because I knew I knew I was uh, going to be heading up that 3,500-foot climb. Um, but before you get to the 3,500-foot climb, you cross a huge meadow. And in that meadow, there was probably six stream crossings that I had to go through. Um, I don't think in, in prior years that the stream crossings have been an issue. There is a river that you also have to cross. Um, the river, of course, is always there. There is a rope uh, um, across it to help you wade through the current. Um, the other stream crossings are not, they're not fast moving streams, um, but they are deep. I mean, they're at least up to your knees. One of them I slipped and, and about went all the way in. So that kind of shows how those go. Um, it was fast and deep. I yeah. mean, we have pictures. <laughs> yeah. So as I started the climb at mile 40 is when the, the, the actual climb starts. Mile 40 to 45 is where the, the pass is at 45 miles. Um, my feet were practically numb. But I, I can't complain because your feet at this point have been hurting and it actually felt really good to get them wet. Um, I did have an extra change of socks in my my um, backpack that I thought if I needed, I could change out my um, my socks, but never felt the need to, just kept uh, motoring up that climb. And, and actually, I mean... I don't know if most people know, but my dad and I are big hikers and have been um, uh, hiking buddies for the last uh, 20 plus years. And um, as I climbed this pass, it, it really brought back the memories of and how appreciative I was to my my dear sweet dad, who who we've hiked um, a certain mountain here in Utah. Um, my dad's done it 300 times, and I've accompanied him 200 times up that mountain, all in consecutive months. Um, and that's hmm. over about 15 years. So as I climbed this mountain, my thoughts, you know, turned to my dad and how grateful I was to him that, uh, you know, I was out there on that mountain up going up that trail. And I was as strong as I was because of him. So lots of emotions as I went up that climb. And um, you can tell as you're motoring up that climb that this is the make or break point for this race. There's people slowing down. There's people throwing up on the side of the trail. You know, elevation is becoming a huge issue as you climb up the side of this mountain. But as you, as I was saying before, it is a beautiful mountain. There is a, a river that's gushing down the side of the trail. Um, it, it's just stunning. It's just absolutely the smells of the of the the climb, the pines. It, it was just it was spectacular. So you know you kind of forget about the pain that you're in, and you got to appreciate why you're out there. And um, as I climbed up that, uh, came above the tree line, you see the aid station. The aid station is actually a half a mile below the actual pass. They can't get 
um, food and water up on top of the pass. So they they do it in the in the big valley bef- below the pass, and they use llamas to get all of the equipment up there. And so there's llamas out grazing in the in the meadows with the wildflowers mm. and. And, you know, there's wonderful people up there to assist you and, and get you some mashed potatoes and some ramen um, before you uh, continue up to the top of the pass. And and as I, before, before I even got to that um, aid station at mile 44-ish, um, the leaders, uh, the, 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 the gentleman that won the race was already coming back down. So he was already how many miles ahead of me 14 i, I know yeah. so mm-hmm. just just flying you know that's when you appreciate just on the like in the mountain bike race how how incredibly fit and um these people are that can go so fast so climbed up and hit the top of the pass and got struck with an immense amount of wind it was so windy up there blew my hat off had to chase that down um <laughs> but usually on that pass is where storm clouds can roll in hail can come in and everything and i just had some wind so i'm not going to complain at all about that um the descent off the other side is brutal it's 2 miles and it is just basically like a ladder um and it's a shorter descent or will be a ascent here in a minute for me, but it's only about a two mile, um, a really steep two mile descent. And then you do those rollers into the aid station. And as I rolled into the aid station more, you know, there's many people that are starting to come back up the climb, all that are now on their way back. Um, and it's fun to be cheered on and to cheer those people on just the same as it on the mountain bike race. Um, as I rolled into Winfield, um, you know, Melissa was out about half a mile above the aid station waiting for me because she was now going to turn around and pace me. And she brought me into the aid station and I was not feeling the greatest. I mean, I think that's kind of your low point, 50 miles in um, and exhausted, exhausted, stomach starting to hurt again, um, legs hurting. And now I got to turn around and go back and do everything I've just done. And I got to do it again. And it's a little daunting, but now at least I have my daughter with me. And, and that was really nice. And then of course, to see Eldon, um, always there with his big smile on and and ready to help me. (laughs) And why don't you tell us what happened with the aid station with that gentleman that decided that he, there there was a fatty fan at the aid station. (laughs) (laughs) I, 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 I love my fans, but uh, <laughs> as as uh, as I'm working to get Lisa ready, uh, someone came over and wanted to talk to both of us because he, he wasn't just you know someone who liked you know liked the podcast. He also was a big fan of Lisa, and so he's asking questions and and, and talking about you know talking about how much he likes the show. And I am just I am unable to really communicate with him at the time, so I I, I have to apologize for maybe perhaps being a little more brief with him. Then I, I should have been. I wasn't. I don't think I was rude, but I might have been. I, I just, I, you know, I had a wife to take care of. But um, it's funny, it, can't get away from those fans. And, and, <laughs> and, and most of the time, certainly don't want to. I just, I just uh, you know, had a lot, to, a lot on my mind, and was worried about you know my wife, who you know had gone fifty miles. If you can imagine running fifty miles, and then you get to that, and you're at around twelve thousand feet at this point, and thinking, okay. Not only do I have to go do that again, but the first thing I have to do in this 50 mile, in this next 50 miles is another giant climb. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was, you know, you know, another shout out to uh, Melissa, who was not only about to pace Lisa, but was doing this in the full throes of a bad cold. She was not feeling well at all. And she totally suppressed that and put it away and did not complain at all about it. She you know, she killed it for uh, pacing Lisa for the next 12 miles, which is, um, you know, would bring Lisa, uh, you know, across snowfields and across rivers back to <laughs> the um, to the Twin Lakes aid station uh, and push, I will say, Lisa. And she can talk about that, but push her hard so uh, so that Lisa would arrive at that 60 mile point in good position to uh, finish the race. 
Yeah. So, um, so we'll back up a little bit and let people know that at the mile 50 mark, you can pick up um, a pacer at that point. Um, and not only are they a pacer for you, which gives you encouragement along the way and keeps your mind focused during the night, but they also are what they call a mule. <laughs> um, Melissa could carry all of my stuff if I wanted her to. So um, for this climb, most importantly, I let her carry all of my water um, and my food, which really helps lighten the load as you go up and over that pass. So, um, yeah, Melissa was a great help, really a nice motivator as we motored up that other side of the pass and we hit the top and she got some great pictures, which is something that are just, I mean, priceless, the pictures that we got on top of Hope Pass together. Um, and then as we des- as we started to descend, she basically said, Mom, you've got to put away those poles. You are using them as a crutch, and you are going way too slow. We need to make it back to that aid station before dark. And so she totally motivated me, made me put away my my poles, and I actually ran down um, the other side. And then we hit those streams and rivers, and, and she kept me running. And we rolled into Twin Lakes, like Eldon was saying just right at dusk, just exactly where I wanted to. I think I rolled in at 8.05 and the sun sun was just about to set. So I made my goal. And that, in my mind, I had told myself and Melissa had had commented, if you can make it back to Twin Lakes before the sun sets, 7.30 or 8, you can basically walk in. You could walk it in. So that had been in the back of my mind. And I really... That was my goal. And here I was. I had just rolled into Twin Lakes at 8.05. So, hmm. and then this is where my my wonderful crew, I, we were like a, a pit stop at a NASCAR <laughs> race. Uh, I, they sat me down in my in a chair. And um, prior prior to this race, I, I've suffered from bunions. And um, it, it the alignment of my feet are off. And I end up getting really problem uh, callus areas on my feet, which then I I develop blisters under the calluses. And I knew nine months ago, a year ago, that I wouldn't be able to do a 100-mile race without getting this problem solved. So I did a lot of investigating, book reading, YouTube watching on how to tape my feet um, to prevent this from happening. So as I rolled in, to Twin Lakes, I had just crossed those, those you know, six, seven river crossings. My feet were wet. My tape, it essentially, that I used to tape my feet up had fallen off. So um, we had gone through this in practice, but sat down and I had um, Blake, my son, pull off my shoes and socks, retape my feet, put my shoes and socks back on, um, get me some warm clothes. And we were in and out, and I think in about 20 minutes, and had me eaten something. And we were headed out um, with my new pacer, with my friend Jeline that I've been friends with since I was in fifth grade. Um, so a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> She's a hoot and very energetic. And she carried me through. Um, actually, she paced me for uh, two aid stations worth. So she paced me for 25 miles mm. and um, got me through the night. And as I rolled out at Twin Lakes uh, and started up the first climb... That's when the, the stomach went south on me. I'd been running now for 16 hours using the, my tried and true goo, and now my body did not want goo anymore. So that was my challenge. I had gotten to the point in the race where if I speed walked, I could probably walk it in, but I had to deal with a really upset stomach. And so that became my focus throughout the night was, you know, propel myself forward, but I had to fuel myself. And that was really frustrating. Um, Jeline um, had had brought a bunch of food and she'd offer me whatever she had, but she was very good about reminding me every 30 minutes, it's time. We got to get you something to eat. So probably for, I mean, until about mile 60-ish, uh, uh, <laughs> to about mile 60, she, uh, things were going down. I was able to eat um, uh, and, and, and propel myself forward. The, the night was beautiful, big orange uh, moon out there. Uh, and then um, descended into outward bound aid station at about one o'clock in the morning. Um, and the temperatures dropped. 
It was really cold. Um, Eldon met us at mile 77 with some mm-hmm. warmer clothes. Yep. And as well as, uh, as well as food and so forth. And, and I want to say on it that, uh, a real, uh, a, a lot of gratitude has to go Jolene's way, uh, because, um, while I think like a lot of racers having been out for that long, anyone who's ever done a 24 hour race knows that at some point you don't want to eat anymore. And, but want doesn't equal can't. And so Jolene made Lisa continue to eat. And I think in equal parts, Lisa was get, eat, getting uh, goo and uh, cliff and you know all kinds of stuff that came from our good friends at the feed. But uh, then probably in equal parts, uh, also getting Tums. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and those two things, you know, and, and Jolene just made sure that Lisa kept eating because anyone who's ever done a big, long race and has stopped eating knows that at some point you can't dig out of the hole that you're in. Lisa, I mean, she wanted to start digging that hole, um, but her friend did not let her. So, you know, having having a, a strong pacer, a strong-willed pacer can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, and the stomach issues just continued as I went through the outward at bound aid station. Now we're back to the the path that crosses the mountain bike ride. So, you know, I've got the power line climb to go. Um, the one thing I can say is that it is nice to go up power line without having to push a bike. Um, <laughs> but the stomach issues were just, they were just ramping up. So like Eldon said, um, my wonderful pacer said, well, I've got some Tums. Do you think Tums would help? Well, of course Tums would help. So it was just a game. Um, 30 minutes would go by. I would take a goo. Um, or try to eat something, she'd give me some Tums, stomach would settle down for about five minutes, and then she would remind me it's time to eat again. And at one point, I was just like, I'm done. I can't eat anymore. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, if I say that, that is what pulls people out of this race. I've got to eat. I've got to fuel myself. I'm only at mile 84. I still have 15 miles to go. And um, so she kept me on track. Uh, finally, when I hit, the, um, as I was telling Eldon, it's just, it, it's kind of funny as you're reliving these different parts of the course, you know, I, I'm coming up power line and I know how it is on a bike and I know the relief you get when you hit the top of the power line climb and you've got this really fun sugar loaf descent. Well, when you're running it's no fun descending. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. like I said, just when the stomach was at its worst and um, played the game for probably a good more than an hour to get down Sugarloaf. Um, you know, and it takes, what, 20 minutes on a bike, if that, 15 minutes. So, um, Yeah, from the top of Powerline <laughs> to the uh, end of the dirt at Hagerman's, you, you're not pedaling a single stroke no. if you don't feel like it. No. It is It is recovery. It is fun. fun. I and mean, you're it, smiling. it's actually fun. Yep. I mean, you're having a great time. Um, boy, yeah. next time you next time you do the Leadville 100 on a bike, <laughs> think about the runners for a second yeah. who do do that part of the course all on foot, and yep. there is no recovery during that. It is just a quad buster. Yep, and we're looking at it like we're at three in the morning at this point too. So I mean, the dead of night, not feeling well, and at this point, the race is spread out. I I mean, you can you can hear people around you, but there's no one really in front of you, directly in front of you. Sometimes there'd be a really fast runner just come hauling by you. And it's like, wow, someone has something left. Where did you come from? I know, how exactly. Do you, how do you have that all of a sudden? Yeah. Exactly. So um, eventually- Are you a, are you alone on Sugarloaf at this point? Or yeah. Which, do you Pow- show up? Okay. Mm-hmm. Going up power line, it was a, it was a pretty steady stream of runners. Um, like I said, I was not passing anyone at this point. Um, we are all just power hiking. And of course, some people- People have more more in them to power hike than others. Um, everyone is super friendly and you know encouraging as they pass you, um, or you know it, it, just everyone is you know especially the pacers. It's just funny. Pacers are just out there just chit chatting. The runners are not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, do you have a pacer here at Sugarloaf? Yeah. Or so, is your pacer Jolene, gone? Jolene yeah, my friend, still is okay. st- still with me. This is her chunk of, of it. And, and, I, and I guess you can see the other lights, right? I mean, people have lights on, so you can kind of see lights in the distance at times. Yeah, but you know, it's 
it, like I said, you're pretty spread out, especially coming down Sugarloaf. And that might have been because I was not running, um, that we kind of just were in our own little tunnel that, you know, I, I, a tunnel of darkness. Um, eventually, when we got to the single track that leads me down to May Queen, um, uh, there was more people coming. But you have to, you have to realize that the race, the field of runners at this point is diminishing because everybody, if you don't make an aid station at a certain time, you're getting pulled. So here that 800, those 800 runners is now is dwindling down. People are not made to keep making cutoffs. There is less people out there on the trail. So that's something to keep in mind too, that, um, you know, it, the field is dwindling. Yeah. This run's getting smaller and it's smaller. smaller and smaller. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, we eventually made it to May Queen about five in the morning, um, uh, still dark, um, found Eldon um, right away, which was nice. And my thoughts at this point went to turn to my daughter a lot because I paced Melissa um, the last 13 miles of the race last year. Um, she was barely making cutoffs. She rolled into the aid station at May Queen at about 6.30 exactly. That's the cutoff. She barely made it. I was there at 5. And so I thought, I, I've got, I think I've got this, you know. And every time I would see Eldon during the night, I would be, am I going to make this, Eldon? Am I going to make it, Eldon? Am I going to make it? <laughs> and Eldon would reassure me, yes, I was going to make it, which I needed to hear. I was so grateful that that he was so positive for me um, and let me know that, that yes, I was going to do it because I needed to hear that. There's so many lows in this race. I did make one mistake one time with uh, w- in answer to that question. It, it, you know, this is backing up just a little bit, but she, uh, Lisa had asked, am, am I going to make it? And I said, yeah, you've, uh, you've got nine hours and it's just one more marathon. <laughs> and that was such the wrong thing to say. I mean, it's hear, hearing from, you know, I guess, you know, as soon as I said it, as it's three quarters of the way out of my mouth, I'm thinking what she is not wanting to hear right now is that she has another marathon to run. And another nine mm-hmm. hours. <laughs> right, right. But no. she had not, knowing that she had nine hours to make it, I don't think was the problem. Right. She had, she had, I was trying to let her know she had all the time in the world to get this final quarter of the race done. But uh, it, it's still kind of laid out for her the vastness of what she still had to accomplish. But mm-hmm. um, she did, uh, she, she was looking, you know, and just, you know, she, of course, she couldn't see herself. But I could see her and she had, uh, you know, Lisa generally has a very focused, very, uh, very much of a game face. But that was all gone by the time uh, we got to um, uh, the the 25 mile aid station, you know, 25 miles to go aid station, I should say. So 75 ish aid station and then May Queen, the final aid station, uh, people who are coming through look so dazed and so exhausted. It is, I mean, it, it's inspiring to see at one level that there are people who are still going in spite of their uh, their exhaustion, but it's also, you know, a little bit heartrending um, that, uh, and I, I too was thinking about Melissa. She, you know, came through and, you know, technically missed that cutoff, but uh, because of her work this year, I would say it was a big part of why Lisa was able to come through and uh, uh, with a good cushion of time for that final uh, half marathon's worth of of the race. Which is really Mm -hmm. crazy because I remember looking down at my watch and seeing that I had – I had run 88 miles, 88 miles. Can you even (laughs) comprehend 88 miles? But I still had a half marathon to go. So I traded out um, one one friend for another friend. Another um, friend, Lynette, um, paced me in the last 13 miles. Um, Another running friend that I've had forever. Um, But now you have got to realize that it's been 25 hours that I've been running. It's, it's, It's the dawn of a new day. And every morning I start out the dawn of a new day <laughs> going to the bathroom. And so I had the same problems again. I had to go to the bathroom. So it was like running. And now we're just running back around Turquoise Lake towards the finish. And I was just constantly running out into the bushes and having to do my business. I, I can't believe that you can actually poop out goo, but you can. 
yeah. <laughs> it looks a really <laughs> whole lot like it goes in. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, that so that was an issue. At about mile ninety, I think I kind of panicked and I said, uh, I said to my uh, my pacers, I don't think I'm going to make this. I'm I'm not going to make this, and. I started running. I could not believe it. I was running. They were having a hard time keeping up with me, but I was so scared. I just, I didn't really, I didn't really know what time of day it was, but the sun was coming up and I knew if the sun comes up, that means I'm pr- approaching my 30 hours. So I ended up run walking around Turquoise Lake. Uh, and as I came out of Turquoise Lake, um, I was greeted by my wonderful family um, and friends um, they intersected right there where the, the trail crosses the road and they cheered me on, um, which is just amazing. Amazing to see how much love and support um, out there on the trail. Been up all night waiting for me to come around that lake and there they were. Um, and they ran a little bit with me and then they needed to hop to the end so that they could run the final mile with me. And um, that just left me and uh, my friend Lynette as we power hiked up the boulevard, basically. Um, And as I was going up the boulevard, I looked up and there's my son, um, Blake, out there. Uh, He'd ridden his bike down the boulevard. And I just remember he just kept repeating, I am so proud of you, Mom. I am so proud of you. I can't believe you've done that. And to have your son say that to you is just, it's pretty dang amazing. And uh, just to feel his love and support. And then we crested the boulevard, which you're familiar with. And that's where I met the whole family. And they continued on um, down the pavement with me to the finish line. And what a spectacular moment um, to cross with, with all my loved ones. And honestly... I, I really I was telling Elton I had the easy job of just putting one foot in front of the other for 20, 29 hours. Um, but I couldn't have done it without Elden. I couldn't have done it without my daughter and her boyfriend and Blake and my pacers and, and their husbands that came out to support them, to drive them out to the to Leadville seven hour drive just to be with me and you know all of us right there um like I said this whole this whole race was more about realizing how many people love me and want me to succeed in my stupid (laughs) endeavors (laughs) so um what a spectacular moment but I told Eldon as we approached the finish line honey I can't hang out at the finish line for very long because I don't want to be that YouTube video that's <laughs> where the person's pooping on down their leg. So let's get me home. <laughs> so didn't didn't spend a whole lot of time at the finish line, but I did cross it in 28 hours and 51 minutes, which was better than I'd ever dreamt of. So uh, uh, hats off to my crew because I couldn't have done it without them. And mm-hmm. and I I want to add one or actually two people onto this. Uh, waiting at the finish line were both uh, Ken Clover and Marilee. And oh, I don't remember Marilee's last name. So, so it, Paul, yeah, it, it was just the the founders of the race were there, and it's not like they just pop in and pop out for you know an hour here and there. The the span of time. And, you know, people are finishing that race is pretty extraordinary. So the founders showing up and and being there for the race finishers is a you know it, it's a part of what makes uh, this running version of the race, which has been going on for I guess more than a decade more. Yeah, thirty six bu- years, I think. They yeah, said. so yeah, it, it, like eleven years longer than the mountain bike race has been going on. Really, you know, a truly iconic uh, century run and, and a real bucket list item. So, hmm. ah, exp- an amazing day. And then I will say, and this is this is something that Lisa probably would not have included in her story. Uh, we did the award ceremony, and Lisa was took uh, had moved up to, or I guess had moved to third as a, a, in the lead woman standings. She took a nap, and then she went and cleaned the house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, how soon was it uh, after the race that you did something physical in nature? And that, that, that answers that. 
<laughs> I mean, Fatty's been revealing to me like you'll go out after a big some of the big uh, lead woman races that you'd done previous to the run, and you the next day you're out training or doing something pretty hard. So. Um, cleaning the house, Wait, wowza. I had that's, to pack. We had to go home the <laughs> next day. <laughs> no, you didn't have to do anything, actually. <laughs> no, but, I mean, really, looking back, I it, I really wasn't horribly sore. Um, I, yeah. I, I did lose a toenail. And if anyone's ever lost a toenail before, you know how excruciatingly painful it can be to have a blister underneath your toenail. Um, so that was probably the worst. And, I mean, my muscles... They were sore, but I've I've had I was more sore on training runs. So, mm -hmm. you know, the pace just being different. I don't know. It was it wasn't too bad, but honestly, it's been now two weeks, and I tried to run a couple of days ago, and that didn't go over too well. So, running is still not not great, but I can bike and mm. happy to bike. Yeah, went on a bike ride uh, today. Fanny and I love to talk about gear on the show. One of the beauties though of running is that it doesn't take a lot. You need yeah. a pair of running shoes and a pair of shorts to do it. But so you did this on one pair of shoes, right? Did you so, go in with a new pair of shoes or how does that work? So I, I, I actually did change out my shoes at mile 60. So two pairs did, of okay. shoes for the whole thing. Um, and I had actually uh, run in both of those shoes to break them in prior. So I, I probably, uh, I didn't want to go in with new shoes for either one of them, but they, they both had at least you know, 20 miles worth of running. Mm -hmm. and, she, mm -hmm. and she runs in the Ultra Olympuses, is, yeah. you know, I think worth saying. We're right. both big fans yeah. of this shoe. And the, y your socks are weird. Oh, yeah. I, I oh. use what they call in Jinji socks. So I use toe socks. Um, toe socks. Yeah. Yeah. Those, yeah. You, yeah. If you've seen them, you, you wonder how in the world anyone would ever like those. But with me taping my, I tape my toes, it's really, it's been, it's been great. They don't rub on each other. So, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the big question, are you glad you did it? <laughs> I, I, I'm super glad I did it. As I was, as I was running it, I, I said, you know, to, to Jolene, my friend during the night, I'm like, you know, hundred miles are stupid. I, and I was really, <laughs> really crazy to sign up for this one, but I'm crazy, but I'm not insane. It's the people that sign up for their second one that are truly insane because they know what they were in for. So I'm just crazy. I'm not doing another one. Bucket list checked. Done. No more. No more hundreds in my future. And it's been a couple weeks, so I... <laughs> I, 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 I I I guess halfway believe you when you say that. No, no more. No, no. Check. Blood woman, check. <laughs> right. But in your pursuit for 20 mountain bike finishes, I mean, you've probably learned something from the run that'll help you. You know, I, I contemplated that. Is there something, something uh, to help me with the run? I think the run helped me. I mean, the bike ride definitely helped me with the run. So, uh, yeah, you have deep experience with how to, how to do in, nutrition and yeah. how to sort of keep in, keep up a good regimen and that it, and obviously great legs and lungs from, from that. But also you've got, I mean, why this was the longest you've ever run. It's, it's by no means, um, you know, you're, your first marathon or anything past that. So, yeah. yeah I mean, I, but I, I learned basically from, from the run that the mountain bike is much more enjoyable to ride your mountain bike for 12 <laughs> hours or less is, is there's fun in riding a mountain bike. I don't know if there was a whole lot of fun in the run, except for what I created for myself. I mean, like I said, the, the, realizing the beauty of my surroundings, realizing the love of my family and, and friends crewing for me, that's what made the run so amazing and um, and grateful that I did it. But yeah, going back to the mountain bike where I could descend <laughs> quickly and enjoyably. You'll never look at Sugarloaf the same, will you? No, or Powerline. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, it's a great story, though. Uh, twenty eight fifty one, beautiful time too. Was that close to what you were thinking? You know, when you went in in the in the back of my mind, I was hoping for twenty eight. Um, and so, you know? I, which only because twenty eight would give me a two hour buffer. I mean, I didn't, you mm -hmm. know, I didn't care about time per se. I just didn't want to be just you know barely making you know running up the boulevard to make sure that I finished. So that right. that was why I was shooting for twenty eight. 
Well, Fatty, uh, Fanny, it looks like you're next. When are you doing the LT100 run? Oh, you know, I I started doing some uh, trail running because I would love to be able to say that I'm a lead man. I, I talked about that for, for a long time, but the fact is I – uh, I do more than I, I just have terrible form and just don't have any endurance running experience. I, I uh-huh. cannot picture myself doing what Lisa has done. Uh, I think she is going to be the sole led woman, led man in, uh, the, in the hammer fatty relationship. And, uh, <laughs> I, I'll just be proud to crew for, her. um, uh, but it sounds like I don't have to do it again. So I'm okay with that too. <laughs> <laughs> One and done. There's. <laughs> All right, well, let's wrap up uh, Season 2, Episode 24 of the Leadville Podcast, presented by Floyd's of Leadville. We're looking for more great race stories to tell, so if you had something crazy or magnificent or tragic or triumphant happen during your go at the LT100, be it the run or the mountain bike ride, drop us a line. To do so, head to the leadville100podcast.com comment section and get in touch. Also, follow me on Twitter. I am at Fat Cyclist, and Hottie is at Michael Houghton. You can also find us on Facebook. We're both active in the Leadville 100 MTB participants group. We should be active in the in the run group as well, I guess, especially for this episode. Anyway, you got a question, you can DM us on Facebook, and there's a great chance that we will answer it here. And if you like our show, support it by giving us a five-star rating and review over at Apple Podcasts. Also, share it with your other cycling friends and support our sponsors. Let them know you appreciate them making this show possible. Thanks so much for listening, and we will see you at the 2020 starting line, but not for the run. Spectators, one more time, make some noise for all these incredible runners out here. Let's let them hear it. Show them the love they love. We are 60 seconds away from kicking off the 2019 Leadville Trail 100 run, presented by La Sportiva. Good luck, dig deep, you got it, today is yours runners, less than one minute to go.